This is a slightly adapted version of a talk I delivered at a conference on the Corpus of Greek Ritual Norms at the Collège de France, Paris, in May 2018. You can find a copy of the handout for the talk on my site on academia.edu. That's academia.edu. And the handout is fairly important for following the talk in this case. Thirty-eight of the inscriptions so far published in the Splendid Collection of Greek Ritual Norms, CGRN, are Attic, and as of the 3rd of January this year, we have annotated English translations of all of them on Attic inscriptions online, including links to CGRN. In many cases, we've simply referred the AIO reader to the useful discussion of the inscription on CGRN. In some cases, we've sought to supplement the CGRN version by supplying a complementary perspective or emphasis. In three cases, however, we've flagged the provisional character of the versions we've published on AIO as the inscriptions in question, or in one case a fragment of the inscription in question, is in the British Museum, and we are accordingly re-editing them in the context of our project to edit all 250 or so Attic inscriptions in UK collections, Project AIUK. These three are all 5th century inscriptions and are the larger of the two Boustrophodon altars from the city Eleusinion, IG1 cube 232, which is CGRN7, a small 5th century sacrificial calendar, IG1 cube 246, which is CGRN20, and the well-known sacrificial regulations of the Deem Scambonidae, IG1 cube 244, which is CGRN 19. What I'm going to do is to present my current working text of each inscription and make some fresh observations on each one as we go along. First one, the Boustrophodon altar from the Eleusinion. As you will see from the handout, our first inscription is composed of 22 small fragments, all inscribed in a rather characteristic Boustrophodon style, mostly discovered in the Agora excavations in the area of the city Eleusinion. The British Museum fragment, Fragment C, was the first to be published in the 18th century. Here is a text of the British Museum fragment. And here is a translation of all the fragments with fragment C highlighted. Fragment C was discovered by Richard Chandler in an unspecified wall at Athens and published by him in 1774. He recognised that it was inscribed Boustrophodon, but neither he nor the early German editors were able to make much sense of it, and it wasn't until Hicks's edition as number 74 in the Attica volume of the Greek inscriptions in the British Museum, published exactly a century after Chandler's Editio Princeps, in 1874, that the fragment was recognised as making provisions for religious rites. It was Hicks who in particular made the crucial observation that in lines 24 to 27 of fragment C, provision is being made for the ancient festival of Zeus on the Acropolis, the Dipolieia, at which the sacrificer, the Boutupos, lines 24 to 25, is known to have featured as an officiant, drawn apparently from the Genos Thaulonidae, as Hesychius notes, S.V. Butupon. 
The next major advance came in 1948, with the publication of Anne Jeffrey's famous article in Hesperia. She combined the British Museum fragment with 21 others of a similar character, mostly discovered in the Agra excavations, suggesting that they belonged to a rectangular altar inscribed on its two broader faces and one of its narrower faces. She distinguished this monument from a second smaller altar, now IG1 cube 231, whose fragments had slightly different physical characteristics and whose subject matter was provision for the Eleusinian mysteries, whereas our larger altar seems to be dealing with other festivals. She also made the observation that, though our altar was inscribed in Boustrophodon style, the letter form seemed consistent with a date perhaps in the early 5th century, by which time the Boustrophodon style was no longer in current use in Attica, and she suggested that the inscription represented the consolidation and reinscription of a perhaps diverse range of earlier regulations which had themselves been inscribed Boustrophodon, the older style continuing to be reflected in the reinscription. Geoffrey was inclined to suggest that the monument we have was broken up by the Persians in 480, but she noted too that it wasn't found in the Agora Pazashut, and I wonder if that fact and the general style of the letter forms, which, following the end of the three-bar sigma controversy, scholars are now generally inclined, other things being equal, to date lower in the century than Lewis and Geoffrey, might suggest rather a later uh, rather a date in the aftermath of the Persian invasions, i.e. somewhat later than Lewis and Geoffrey thought, perhaps in the context of a project of reconstruction of inscribed material destroyed uh, by the Persians. In any case, Geoffrey's reconstruction of the fragments of this monument was undoubtedly a brilliant piece of epigraphical scholarship. Her carefully considered text was carried over into IG1 cubed, and it remains to my mind broadly convincing. Though her brilliant collocation of fragments F, G and H to produce the only extensive passage of continuous text must remain tentative, as she herself emphasised. She restored the text here in the light of the provisions for the Thesmophoria in the Deem Collar Goss, IG2 squared 1184. They thus include not only the ubiquitous wine, honey and oil, but also beans, and, as in the Colargos inscription, cheese and white and black sesame seeds. Hesitations here arise from the fact that fragment H is lost, known only from an early 19th century transcript by Ludwig Ross, that there are no actual physical joins to confirm the relative positions of the fragments, and that the white and black sesame seeds, which seem particularly characteristic of the Thesmophoria, are almost wholly restored. Melanon, in lines 65 to 66, is crucial for this part of the reconstruction, but it's perhaps difficult to rule out the commoner Melitos honey. There is also the question as to what celebration of the Thesmophoria would be intended. So far as we know, unlike the Dipolyaea, the Thesmophoria was a diffused rite, celebrated separately in the Deems. And we know of no central observance by the city, of the city as a whole. On this see Clinton's 1996 essay, and in general Parker's discussion of the Thesmophoria in his Polytheism and Society. Clinton speculated that the observation of the festival by the city de Melite, attested for the early 2nd century by the deemed decree honouring their priestess, Agora 16277, might have taken place in the city Eleusinion, but this is very uncertain. 
An alternative theory might perhaps be that the provision in our inscription was for some observation of the festival by the Eleusinian Gene themselves, whether in the city Eleusinion or at Eleusis. Other evidence for celebration of the Thesmophoria at Eleusis is opaque. In any case, given the uncertainties, it would be imprudent to press any particular interpretation here. As Geoffrey herself noted, page 98 of the Hesperia article, whether they, that's the offerings detailed in fragments F, G and H, are to be connected specifically with the Thesmophoria is uncertain. The authority responsible for this inscription is also opaque. Geoffrey noted that the sacrificial calendar of the city as a whole, as revised at the end of the 5th century, contains a provision for heralds at the Dipolieia, Keruxin hoi Dipolieiois. And she inferred a connection with the provision for the Dipolieia in our inscription, which she thus suggested might have been issued by the Genos Kerikes. But more recent scholarship has observed that the city calendar is most likely not referring to the Genos Kerikes, but to a separate group of heralds who had specific functions at the Dipolieia. Parker observes that if the Genos Kerikes were intended here, one would expect that to be clarified by use of the term genos. This leaves us in something of an impasse, and most recently the CGRN editor's comment, no definitive solution can be offered, and the desperate state of these fragments, originally quite detailed it seems, can only be regretted. We are certainly not in the realm of definitive solutions here, but perhaps we may take a further tentative step. As editors have noticed before, this inscription differs from most ritual provisions in that there is no provision for sacrificial animals. While it's possible that this is an artefact of the fragmentary character of the inscription, there is probably just about enough surviving text to infer that it may be significant. What is provided for in this inscription is the extras, mostly vegetable, but also including objects such as spits, and, if my suggested supplement for line 44 is correct, coverings, reading elutra there, um, the extras commonly used in ritual contexts. The provisions are, in that sense, supplementary rather than fundamental. Now, it was a feature of the Athenian system of provision for cult activities, that there was a complex intertwining of provision by the city itself with that of the Gene. The Locus Classicus here is supplied by our fullest document of the workings of a classical Athenian genos, the terms inscribed in the 360s BC of the settlement by arbitration of the dispute between the two branches of the genos Salaminioi, CGRN 84, Rhodes Osborne 37. We learn from that inscription that a major festival of the Genos Salaminioi was a Heraclea celebrated at Porthmos. And in addition to providing for a number of sacrificial animals for the festival, at line 87 the Genos provides for wood for the sacrifices, including those for which the city gives money according to the Kerbase. Kerbase being the obscure term of art used to refer to the city's sacrificial calendar. We observe this in mirror image in the city's calendar, uh, sorry, in the city's own calendar, where at one point animals are supplied by the city explicitly for the genos eumolpidae to sacrifice. I wonder whether in our inscription we might be observing not so much the city's side of the system in action, but the side of the Gene. This seems consistent in general terms with the partial character of the inscription's provisions, and also with its specific provisions, which, most clearly in regard to the Dipolieia, 
appear to complement the provisions of the city's calendar in its late 5th century form, rather than being in some way a predecessor of them, as Geoffrey seems to suggest at some points in her dis discussion. So I'm suggesting that the provisions in our calendar complement the city's system of sacrifice rather than being a an early version of the city's system of the, the sacrificial calendar. In short, Geoffrey may be right that the authority behind our inscription was the Eleusinian Gene, but the logic leading to that conclusion may be somewhat different from the one that she articulated. What I'm suggesting, therefore, is that just as the Genos Salaminioi supplied wood as an adjunct or extra for sacrifices at the city festival, the Heraclea at Porth Moss, so in our inscription, the Eleusinian Gene supplied adjuncts or extras for a number of other city festivals. We can perhaps develop this in relation to two other entries in this inscription of which something can be made. In line 50, and possibly also in line 46, provision is made for Erechtheus, who, like Zeus Polyus, is of course associated with the Acropolis. At the Scyra festival, Eleusinian festival incidentally, the priest of Poseidon Erechtheus processed to Scyron with the priest of Helios and the priestess of Athena under a parasol carried by members of the Genos Etiobutidae. It's quite plausible that the Eleusinian Gene might have provided extras on this or some other occasion at which Erechtheus was worshipped. It's striking that there is again another good candidate in a surviving fragment of the late 5th century revision of the city calendar where the city makes provision for an offering to Erechtheus, perhaps at the Canasia festival. In some cases, at least, the extras in our inscription are supplied to specific officiants. We've already noticed the Butupos at lines 24 to 25. At 43, the recipients are the Phulobasiles, heads of the four old Ionian tribes who feature otherwise in Athenian religion, once again in the city calendar, as one of the sources of authority cited in that calendar. Ectone Fula Basilicone, and as recipients of sacrificial provisions in the city calendar. Again, I don't think it's implausible that the Eleusinian Gene would also have contributed extras at the uh, Senoikia or another city rite which involved these archaic officials, the tribe kings, Fula Basiles. I would make two general observations in support of this suggested interpretation of our inscription. The first is that another feature of it is that there is no pricing of the materials provided for. And indeed, uh, there's a complete absence of any financial information or reference to financial accountability of any kind. This is perhaps arguably more consistent with this being a Genos inscription than a product of the city as a whole or its Cleisthenic subdivisions, for it's clear enough that a concern with the financial aspects was present in the city's sacrificial calendar already in its Salonian version, and a concern with such aspects and with financial accountability in general infuses the two other major 5th century Attic calendars which predate the revision of the city's calendar, but which, significantly perhaps, an ex hypothesi in contrast to our inscription, are based on Cleisthenic deems, the Thoricos calendar, and the ordinances of Scambonidae, which we'll be looking at later on. Ex hypothesi, the Eleusinian Gene must have funded the provisions they made under the terms of our inscription, 
and inscribing them served as a public guarantee of their commitment to do so, before gods and men. But since they were provided from the resources of the Gene themselves, what they cost was not a matter of public interest or record. Second, it would seem quite natural for the Eleusinian Gene under the aegis of Demeter, the goddess of agriculture par excellence, to have had a general function of supplying products of the earth for religious rituals of the city as a whole. Such a function would have an obvious religious logic. We move on now to number two, uh, which is an early sacrificial calendar, perhaps of a deem, as we shall see shortly. Um, it's uh, CGRN number 20 and is IG1 cubed 246. Early editions were based on a, a transcript by rows of face C of the inscription only, we're dealing with a single fragment in this case, by the way, rather than multiple fragments, as in the first inscription. A single fragment. Hicks's 1874 edition of the Greek inscriptions of the British Museum again represented an important advance, being the first to publish all four faces of the inscription. IG1 cubed reflected useful contributions by later scholars, but the most significant progress on the text since Hicks has been made by Peter Toneman, who carried out a fresh autopsy in 2002, resulting in important improvements in readings, most of which I was able to confirm at my own autopsy in 2017, and cogent new restorations, which are reflected in the following revised text. And here is a translation. The original location of this stone, which was among those collected in Athens in the early 19th century for Lord Elgin, is not known. CGRN follows some other editors in assuming an Acropolis find spot or Acropolis original location, but there seems no basis for this. By no means all Elgin's inscriptions originate on the Acropolis. It's an early Attic example of the sacrificial calendar, later perhaps than the inscription we've just been looking at, which as we've seen was inscribed Boustrophodon on what was apparently an altar. But broadly speaking, quite closely comparable to the Scambonidae inscription, which we'll be looking at uh, uh, in a minute, in that it is inscribed orthograde on both the broad and the narrow sides of what's in effect a thin pillar or thick steely. The lettering on this inscription and the Scambonidae inscription is also of a broadly similar style, both display some archaic features, such as the angular nu and the three-bar sigma, though ours shows two progressive features absent in number three. The rows are tailless and there is one four-barred sigma. There seems little reason to dissent from the conventional date of around 470 to 450, though now that features of Attic script once thought to occur exclusively before uh, uh, about the mid-century, in particular the three bar sigma, are known to be present after this time, a somewhat later date cannot be ruled out. Like number one and number three, as von Prot saw, this is patently not part of the city's calendar. The offerings are on too small a scale, 
and mostly it seems local in character. IG1 cubed followed Prot in suggesting that our calendar was issued by a tribe, Fratri or Genos, but tribes and Fratris did not for the most part control their own sanctuaries and cults, and we have no other sacrificial calendars of such groups. A Genos is possible. One might again compare the calendar of the Genos Salaminioi. But our calendar lacks the non-standard year that seems characteristic of the Gene, or may be characteristic of the Gene. At least the year of the Genos Salaminioi didn't begin in the normal first Athenian month Hecatombion, but in Munichion. And it, our calendar also lacks the dovetailing with city rights, explicit dovetailing with city rights, which, as we saw in our earlier discussion, was also characteristic of Gene. I suggest that it's more likely to be the calendar of a small deem, and in fact there are close parallels in content with the two uh, the other two major 5th century deem inscriptions of this type, those of Thorikos and Scambonidae, number three below. It's not specific as regards financial aspects, though we cannot rule out that, like both the Thorikos and the Scambonidae calendars, a concern with accounting was reflected in a separate part of the text, now lost. Face A is too fragmentary to make much of. Face B begins with the provision of extras supplied to a priest for a ritual event now lost and it's followed by an offering to the ubiquitous ancestral figures, the Tritopatres, whose worship is attested in the city calendar, as well as the calendars of Archaea and Marathon. The offering in B17 was correctly read by Tonemon as Teleon, rather than the unaccountable Te of previous editors, a full-grown animal, that is, a designation that might cover a sheep or goat, comparable with the single sheep offered in the Marathon and Erkia calendars. Face C also begins with the provision of extras for a now lost event, but we then have provision for an offering to heroines on the 6th of Thargelion, followed by a description of the extras for it, mentioning a hero or a sanctuary in terms not now recoverable. Two major ritual events are attested in Attica on this date, which was the eve or first day of the Thargelia, a festival of Demeter Chloe on the Acropolis, and a purification of the city, doubtless the expulsion of scapegoats that was part of the Thargelia. No connection is apparent with our offering, which looks like a specific local observance. In lines 26 to 28, we have to do with the Plinteria, a major Ionian rite, marking in Athens the Cledzi the cleansing of the ancient wooden statue of Athena. Fragmentary provisions in the city's calendar for the end of Thargelion appear to relate to it or the associated Kalinteria, beautification festival. The offering of a sheep in our calendar finds a close parallel in the offering of a select sheep to Athena at the Plinteria in Thorikos, OR 146, line 53. The city observance of this festival, the Plinteria, took place at the end of Thargelion, the penultimate month of the Athenian year, 
and that timing is consistent with the implication that the offering in our calendar fell after 6 of Sahagelion. In Thorikos, the festival occurred in the following month, Skiroforion, which coincided with its timing in some other Ionian cities, and perhaps we should envisage there some ritual cleansing of a local statue of Athena. It's not clear what the local rite would have consisted of in our deem, if it is indeed a deem that we're dealing with, beyond the offering of the sheep provided for in this calendar. The fact that Thargelion, the penultimate month, occurs at this point on the stone, and is followed by Skiroforion, the last month, suggests that the issuing group followed the normal Attic year, which is perhaps, as I pointed out, suggestive that it was a deem. The Genos Salaminio, at any rate, had a year starting in Munichion. This sequence in these lines also confirms that the ordering of the faces A, B, C, D adopted in IG1 cubed is probably correct. D will in that case contain events from the end of Skiroforion. The first of these as now convincingly read by Toneman, was for a festival of Hermes. Offerings to Hermes, Hermia, were characteristically made by young men in Gymnasia. They are rather sketchily attested in Attica, and without indications of date in the year, but Toneman points out that in other Greek cities they frequently occurred, as apparently here, at the end of the year. The items provided for are a quantity of wheat and three spits, oboloi, Plato's Lysis, 206c to 207a and 207d, implies that the young gymnasium users would supply their own hieropoioi for Hermia and sacrifice to Hermes on their own account. I wonder if the spits in this case aren't for the roasting of animals supplied by gymnasium users. In other words, what we should perhaps envisage here is an end-of-the-year party organised in the local gymnasium, with the animal to be sacrificed supplied by the users and the local deem supplying the spits for roasting it on, together with wheat, perhaps for making bread or wheat cakes. The final entry in this calendar is for another full-grown offering, this time for each of a pair of heroes in the plain, reminiscent again of the offerings to heroes in other Attic Deem calendars. We move now to the third inscription I'm going to talk about, CGRN 19. IG1 cube 244, the inscription of the deem Scambonidae, Attic City deem, urban deem Scambonidae, which is our third inscription in CGRN in the British Museum, um, and is the most substantial surviving Athenian deem decree datable earlier than around 450 BC, notable, among other things, for supplying what is generally, albeit uncertainly, thought to be our earliest evidence for the formal existence of metics in Attica. Apart from the edition for CGRN, it's also been recently edited by Osborne and Rhodes, where it's number 107 in their collection of Greek historical inscriptions 478 to 404. And it's also been translated by Robin Osborne and myself on AIO. It would accordingly be superfluous to give a full dress account of the inscription here, even if there was time to do so. <clears throat> and I limit myself to some more or less fresh observations on date, on readings and on 
wider context. One slightly confusing aspect of this inscription is that face C acquired that designation before it became apparent in the literature that uh, it was actually the beginning of the inscription. So face C uh, is the first face in the logical order of the text. Here is my text of the whole inscription. And here is a translation. First, on the date, both CGRN and Osborne Rhodes follow the conventional date around 460, which was established as long ago as CIG 1828, in which uh, Burke allocated the inscription to the Prima Pericleae Aetatis Tempora. But this implies that we have more precise dating criteria than is actually the case, and I prefer to give a range around 475 to 450. The best that can be said about the lettering is that, to judge from Comparando in Tracy's recent 5th century volume, it's in a style characteristic of the generation before 450, including, for example, substantially forward-sloping new, which I note is a feature of no cutter working significantly later than 450, identified by Tracy. This now seems a better criterion than the three-barred sigma, which is now, of course, known to occur after 450. Importantly, the physical form of the inscription a pillar or post with two wider and two narrower faces, probably originally inscribed on all four sides, face D is now broken away, is also characteristic of a date before mid-century. After about 450, this post-like four-sided inscribed form um, gave way to the classical steely format, less thick than the pillar, and usually inscribed on one or sometimes two sides only, and not usually inscribed on the, the uh, thinner uh, faces. Useful here is the table recently supplied by Elizabeth Meyer in her Hesperia article for 2016, page 359, table 1, which shows that the only post, to use the term she applies to this kind of uh, inscription, the only post inscribed on more than two sides, firmly datable to after 450 BC, is IG1 cubed 383, an inventory of the other gods of 4298. Second, a word about readings. The stone has been studied intently by a fairly large number of scholars since its discovery in the late 18th century, and major advances from autopsy cannot now be expected. In the text before you, I have silently made some very minor adjustments to readings, none of which affects the sense. The only one worth drawing your attention to is in the very first line, where my autopsy tends to support Sally Humphrey's uh, brilliant conjecture of a heading for the whole inscription, Thesmia Scambonidone. You'll see from the apparatus that there is also additional support for the reading of the Epsilon of Thesmia uh, as early as Burke's CIG. This heading, therefore, states clearly what the inscription contains, the Thesmia ordinances of the Scambonidae. This is the only instance of precisely this term in Attic epigraphy, though uh, it is used by the Athpol in the context of the anti-tyranny law, 
and words from the same root were used to denote the legislation of Draco, Thesmoi, and the titles of the six archons who were primarily responsible for the administration of justice, the Thesmothetai. It had solemn, archaic connotations, therefore, entirely consonant with the substantive provisions. It also differs from the usual classical term for a deemed decision, psephisma, in lacking any particular implication as to whether the provisions were enacted by popular vote. There is no preamble, no statement that the um, provisions of the decree were resulted from a resolution of the deems men. The decision to set up this inscription will, we may perhaps assume, have been made by the deem as a whole. What drove its inscription at this particular time is unclear. Um, it might perhaps have been something like the need to transfer old provisions on a decaying wooden post to the medium of stone. Or it might have been something like the need to clarify the entitlement of metics to shares of the sacrifices. But some of the provisions may have been more recent in origin than others, that's common sense I think, and the more recent ones may have been decided by a popular vote. But the use of the term Thesmia implies that these provisions are, and should for the future be regarded as, the established ordinances, the accrued custom and practice of the deem. As Robert Parker points out to me, uh, we might compare the use of the term patria, ancestral traditions, used at around the same time, perhaps, in the assembly decree confirming the privileges of the genos praxiergidae, IG1 cubed 7. These are the patria of the praxiergidae. But it's notable that in the Praxiergidae decree, this uh, introduction is preceded by a, quite a lengthy preamble, making clear that the patria of the Praxiergidae are inscribed by virtue of a decision of the council and people, and uh, as a consequence of an oracle of Apollo. Thesmia, then, I think the unique choice of this essentially non-democratic, it must be said, term to describe the deem's laws is worth pausing over. It's not perhaps coincidental that it appears in what seems to be our earliest deem inscription, and it perhaps deserves more attention in discussion of the development of democratic ideology in the deem's, Broadly speaking, perhaps supplying an argument for those who are inclined to argue against the idea that democracy sprung fully formed from the head of Cleisthenes. Scambonidae was one of five Cleisthenic deems within the city of Athens itself. It seems to have occupied the northwestern sector of the city. Chandler's discovery of our inscription in the floor of a house by the Hephaestion is one of our few pieces of evidence for the deem's location. And it returned three councillors in the 4th century, probably implying an adult male citizen population of this period in the low hundreds. Significantly, it also gave its name to the city treatise of Leontis. There are indications that the river Eridanos, which might, it seems, have formed the southern boundary of the deem, functioned as a spatial marker already in the Bronze Age, and Scambonidae, an obscure name of patronymic form, and the archaic festivals provided for in the inscription, confirm that, like other deems that produce comparable 5th century inscriptions such as Thorikos, it was clearly a functioning community long before Cleisthenes restructured it into a deem. If Hicks's unfortunately uncertain restoration of lines A12 to 13 
plan to Komaku, except the Komark, village chief, is correct. This may reflect the continued existence of the old order alongside the new. Characteristically of deemed decrees at this period, the subject matter is provision for religious sacrifices, combined with accountability of deem officials. Precisely the same concerns are apparent, for example, in the sacrificial calendar of Thorikos. Accountability is one of the three key elements in democratic ideology in the earliest piece of extended political theorising in Greek literature, the debate on the constitutions dramatically set in Persia in uh, 522 BC by Herodotus, Book 3, Chapter 80, where in the rule of the mass, which is Herodotus' term for democracy, officials are accountable, and this is a key criterion of that, as opposed to oligarchy and monarchy, who puthionon de archain eke. And it was understood that in Athens this principle of accountability of officials went back to Solon at least. Accountability in the context of our inscription has a religious aspect in two senses, in that expenditure on religious observance is central to the inscription's substantive provisions, faces C to A, and in that religious sanctions, as represented in this inscription by the official's oath, play a crucial role in securing it, face D. The factors driving inscription of the text operate, it seems, in parallel. Inscribing the Thesmia in a religious sanctuary was patently appropriate to their substantive provisions, having the effect of endowing them with a solemn permanence before gods and men. C to A. And inscribing the oath of the officials endowed the sanction that secured the proper management of deemed funds itself with a solemn permanence, D. The connection between the terms of the oath, on D, and the substantive provisions in C to A is not, however, quite direct. What the officials swear is not precisely that they will enact the provisions set out in C to A, but they will, to paraphrase, properly manage the deem's funds. This is both a narrower and a broader commitment than the provisions in C to A. Narrower in that some of the provisions in C to A are not specifically financial, continuing the meat distribution until sunset, for example. Broader in that there will have been aspects of the deem's financial management that went beyond accounting for the sacrifices provided for in C to A. Two other features, however, are noteworthy in this context. Unlike some other Attic sacrificial calendars, in particular the city's own calendar, but also the extant 4th century, major 4th century calendars, the Tetrapolis, Erchia, Tethras, Eleusis and Salaminioi, there is no detailing of prices and costs of sacrifices provided for. To this extent, the deems officials in Scambonidae in the first half of the 5th century, or wherever precisely we are, second quarter of the 5th century, are given more discretion than their 4th century counterparts in other deems, but they remain accountable for the overall management of the deems' finances. If the demarch and the Hieropoioi spend too much, for example, on the full-grown sheep or goat for sacrifice to Leos, or fail to raise a reasonable sum in the sale of raw meat from the sacrifice at the Sinoikia, they may be held accountable for that in a general way, under the provisions of D. Second, it's interesting that there is an official specifically responsible for audit, the Euthynos. We do not know his precise function or how he carried it out. One may perhaps assume that he would make a report to the deem as a whole, but his very existence emphasises the importance ascribed to this function in this deem, 
and in a general way that is consonant with the impression given by other deem inscriptions. To summarise an emergent point here, if we had to make a judgment about the relative weight given to the idea of accountability and the idea of popular participation in decision-taking as components of the democratic idea at Athens in the second quarter of the 5th century, based on this inscription, accountability comes across as very much the stronger, more developed and more deeply embedded idea. That said, the accountability articulated in this inscription incorporates a notable emphasis on the obligations placed on the demarch and the hieropoioi as to the proper distribution of sacrificial portions. Broad participation in decision-making about the rules of distribution may not be emphasised in our inscription, but broad participation in the distribution itself certainly is. Unlike some other inscriptions making provision for sacrifices, there is also no specificity as regards time, no allocation of the events to seasons, months or days. In a small group this would doubtless be well known and didn't require stating, though our knowledge of the festivals provided for is such that we cannot be sure that they are in fact listed in chronological order. The only event on face C that we can date is the Sinoikia in mid Hecatombion, the first month of the year. It seems to be the third event listed, but we cannot confidently infer that the pre previous two on the list took place in the first half of Hecatombion. The principle of organisation may have been more to do with categories of offering, the first distributed in a particular fashion, the second in a different fashion, while the meat from the third, fourth and perhaps fifth are to be sold raw. That we do not have to do with a strictly calendrical organisation is confirmed rather at A17-19, to where we have provisions for festivals in both the last month, Scyrophorion, namely the Dipoliaea, and the first month of the year, Hecatombion, namely the Panathenaea. In conclusion, I want to emphasise a point about the character of the religion manifested in this inscription, which is that, unlike most sacrificial calendars of Attica, it demonstrates a marked emphasis in this urban deem on religious observances with a focus outside the deem, and a marked lack of locally specific and agriculturally related offerings. Of the five offerings or festivals mentioned, the Epizephyria is entirely unknown, but it took place at the Pythion, possibly a little outside the borders of the Deem, we're not certain about that. The first offering is to Leos, eponym not interestingly of the Deem, Scambonidae, but of the tribe uh, Leontis, to which Scambonidae belonged. Uh, emphasising right from the start the deem status as a component of a larger unit. So the, the first offering is not to the deem's eponym but to the tribal eponym, the eponym of the larger group to which Scambonidae belonged. The next legible offering at 16 is at the Sinoikia on the Acropolis, again just outside the deem itself. And a festival celebrating thematically the binding together of the various communities of Attica by Theseus in the Sinoicism. The two festivals named on face A have similar connotations, the Dipoliaea conjoined with the Panathenaea, festivals celebrating the two deities who presided over Athens' Acropolis, Zeus and Athena, again emphasising what bound together Scambonidae in common purpose with other Athenians, bound together in the universal experience of sacrifice itself, thematized at the Dipoliaea, and bound together in the celebration of Athens' distinctive common identity at the Panathenaea. For the members of Scambonidae, 
a city deem with a perhaps more fluid population of citizens and foreigners than in a typical rural deem. It seems to have been more important to emphasise what bound them together with others, whether other Athenians or Metics, than the distinct local identity that is so apparent in the other Attic sacrificial calendars.